Shockley's celebration was short-lived. Returning to California, he found Shockley Semiconductor in trouble. The company was bleeding money, and history was repeating itself. His prized team of scientists was in revolt. Shockley had in mind a particular device he wanted to have the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory work on. And the darn thing just wouldn't turn out to be reliable or, or uh, economically enough to do the job. But that was Shockley's idea. It was his pet, pet device, and he wouldn't let anybody else work on anything else. He did not want to ha happen in his company what happened at Bell Labs. In other words, two guys going off and doing something monumental. He wanted to make sure that if anything happened monumental, he was going to be the one who was going to do it. After just a year and a half of work, eight of Shockley's best and brightest left to become known in Silicon Valley lore as the Traitorous Eight. They formed their own transistor company, Fairchild Semiconductor. When we started Fairchild, we had uh, no really good idea where we were going, uh, other than that we wanted to make a silicon transistor. Fairchild and Texas Instruments saw a way of connecting transistors without wires or solder and putting four or more on a single piece of silicon. They called the invention the integrated circuit. And Fairchild came out with the first integrated circuit uh, sold commercially in 1961. And that was really a major change in the direction of the whole industry. And uh, those of you who use your PCs today are the distant beneficiary of that original idea of making a complex circuit in one block of silicon. Shockley hired a new crop of scientists, but he could not replace the one person most responsible for the company's problems himself. If Shockley had been a better manager, he'd be one of the richest people in the world today. He would have been the match for Bill Gates. He is the father of Silicon Valley. He knew better than anybody in the world the importance of these machines, of these transistors. He knew that he was revolutionizing the world. He knew that if his company could, could control the direction the transistor should go toward, that he would be very rich. Bill Shockley never did get rich, but two of the traitorous eight did. Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce eventually left the Fairchild Semiconductor to form a little company called Intel, which today is worth billions. Intel makes these silicon wafers. Each one of these little squares is actually a computer chip, the kind you find in your PC. And each square contains four million transistors. So this wafer has about a billion transistors on it. And Intel turns these out by the thousands each day. Many of them are made right here. Like their ancestors, the transistor, the computer chip has invaded every corner of life, so much so that they've become pop icons. And while people know that chips live inside computers, most don't know of the millions of transistors hidden inside each chip. Billions of transistors are now churned out daily by Intel, Motorola, IBM, and other high-tech companies. More transistors are made each year than raindrops fall on California. Ironically, neither Bratton nor Bardeen nor Shockley ever made much money from the transistor. Bell Labs policy required them to hand over their patent rights for one dollar. And AT&T didn't make much money on it either. It gave up the patent rights as part of its attempt to fend off federal antitrust suits. In 1972, Bill Shockley, Walter Bratton, and John Bardeen returned to Bell Labs for the 25th anniversary of the invention of the transistor. We knew we were onto something very important and that uh, transistors would have many applications. Well, when I was a young man, one considered the only way to save the world was to make everybody literate so they knew how to read and write. But now that the natives in all lands can have a cheap battery-operated transistor radio that they can turn on at night in their camp and listen to any broadcast in their own language, whether they know how to read or write or not. And we were looking for, uh, for transistors at the same time that we were paying attention to those things that prevented the first field effect form from working. Bell Labs asked them to recreate their famous photograph. 
letting bygones be bygones, Bratton and Bardeen agreed. Walter Bratton retired from Bell Labs in 1967. His only regret was that his invention helped stimulate rock and roll. He returned home to Washington State and taught college physics. He died in 1987. John Bardeen won a second Nobel Prize in 1972 for his work on superconductivity. He was the first person to win two Nobel Prizes in physics. John Bardeen died in 1991. Bill Shockley became a professor at Stanford University. He again made headlines in the 70s and 80s for his controversial theories on race and IQ. Bill Shockley died in 1989. Our story ends here in Silicon Valley, 3,000 miles and many decades away from where we began. Apricots used to flourish here before transistors. And today, this is the place of big dreams and even bigger egos. And who knows? Perhaps inside one of these plush corporate campuses, some young scientist or engineer is perfecting the next device that will even make the transistor obsolete and revolutionize the world in ways that even we cannot imagine. We traveled a long way to bring you this song, a brand new calypso. If you'd like to find out more about the invention of the transistor, Visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. To order Transistorized on video cassette or the companion book for this program, Crystal Fire, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 Play PBS. Major funding for Transistorized is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance our understanding of the world around us and of the increasing role of science and technology in everyday life. Publication of papers will help your career. Promotions are short if you write 20 a year. They are used in the washroom of the chief engineer at the Hells Bells Laboratory. At the Hells Bells it's a blood at the Hell's Bells Laboratory. Economy squeezes pinch more every day. Coffee and tea breaks have been taken away. They're hoping to make the transistor pay at the Hell's Bells Laboratory.